Welcome, welcome. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Happy Tuesday, indeed. Yes. <laughs> this day's filled with fun and excitement, right? It's, yes. It's nonstop. Is it? Is it like the the renaissance of data? Is that kind of what it feels like? Yes, the rebirth of classicism when it comes to data. <laughs> uh, awesome. Well, welcome everybody, and thank you for joining us. Um, you have both myself and uh, Trace and Marks here. Uh, Trace, do you want to give a brief introduction? Hi. Yes. Uh, name's Trace and Marks. Alteryx Ace. Uh, actually, part of Andrew's class. We've been Ace cohorts for uh, six six years. This is our six. This is our sixth year doing it. Um, and I'm excited to talk about uh, some art. Um, it's art today. Um, art's so fun because it's like it's everyone's perception of of everyone's perception of art is different, right? Like, yeah, can, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think when we're talking about this, right? It's even the scope of what art is is expanding, right? Yeah. I mean, obviously, we may all think of like paintings or drawings first, right? The Louvre. Mm -hmm. Um, or sculptures, I think the the median has kind of changed and evolved over time. Yeah. So. And now, yeah, especially as we move into like crazy world of like NFTs and stuff like that, um, and actually, you know, owning a digital asset, um, and the whole thing's crazy. I saw, I actually read recently that someone paid a million dollars for an NFT. This is, or it was like the first NFT, but it was like a it was like this guy who became a millionaire with crypto, but all, he has like nothing physical and everything is like, he has his computer and um, an apartment and like his whole world is on, on the computer. Um, and like an NFT was this, it was like the first person to buy a million dollar NFT. It was crazy. And that, that was before the announcement of like meta and stuff like that. Yeah. So. And I think when we kind of look at that, right, the, the whole metaverse um, gets me excited because there's different ways of these things kind of manifesting themselves, right? So mm -hmm. um, one that I view is, Trace and you and I are both remote, right? So when we mm -hmm. talk about this, there's this whole digital nomad experience, right? Where, hey, you can work from anywhere. And I don't, feel like our generation has fully realized what that means, right? Like you really can um, do that. Yeah. And you have programs like Remote Year. Um, I just saw another one here in the US where literally you may do a lease agreement with this company, right? And basically you're saying, hey, I'm going to live in any of your buildings for, over the course of the year. I don't know which one it's going to be, right? And literally from month to month, you can actually move cities. And when we kind of talk about oh. that experience, that's when I look at even just the art, right? Are you literally going to lug around like uh, this painting that I have in the background is actually um, from, uh, I'm going to blink, I was going to say Man in the High Castle, but it's not. Uh, what is it? Who is John Galt? So it's... Uh, oh, uh, Alice Shrugged. Yeah, Atlas Shrugged, and then I have Old Man in the Sea here, right? So if I wanted to feel homely, it's these pieces of art that kind of help accomplish that. And with them being yeah. digital, right, all you really need is some screens in the future, and you can just put them on the wall and display them. Gotcha. Yeah, that's true. Or, I mean, again, if you're living like the whole like augmented reality, if you have some sort of augmented reality classes, maybe you don't even need to, you know... <laughs> have the screens you can just wear the glasses and project them on the wall so that when you're uh, brave new world yeah i think <laughs> i think that's crazy just thinking about that so it doesn't even yeah. it doesn't even need to exist from a tangibility perspective but um when we kind of talk about that going forward right there's a couple things that come to my mind with this art like literally i just had a friend who um got ripped off by an NFT, right? So mm. I was talking to him and he said, hey, I didn't know that it was real, right? So when we talk about evaluating these things, 
Um, that's always been true in the art world. I think the difference is just things are starting to move faster, right? Um, yeah. So being able to analyze art um, is essentially image processing, right? Um, and then the other thing that I also find crazy interesting is the fact that um, have you started to see um, AI creating art yet? Uh, isn't that with like the Google, uh, like you used to be able, you can pass Google like a picture and it'll make it look like a Van Gogh or like a, um, yeah. What's it, what was that called? Like the deep dream or something like that? Or the, yes, yeah. I've seen that. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, basically it's just taking on the volume of images, right. And then it will cultivate things on its own based on maybe some of the patterns that mm -hmm. it's seeing within the art. Yeah. Um, I mean, that I just find incredible because as we look at that, it's it's really kind of take things to the next level. Um, and when we talk about the Renaissance, that it may not even necessarily be our Renaissance, right? It could be around data as a whole um, and us learning how to use some of these other mediums um, like images. So now that we've kind of talked about all this theory and we feel like we need a smoking jacket and yeah. a pipe right now, right? <laughs> uh, are you ready to, to dive into, into some workflows? Yeah, yes, I am ready to dive into some workflows. Do you want to start or you want me to go first? Um, if you actually want to go first, because I think I was a little bit, um, what is that called? Uh, overly excited and I may have overextended myself with the size of data that I'll be working with today. So we'll give it a couple more minutes to run here. All right, I'm gonna share my second screen then. Um, so, well, actually I do wanna talk about real quick something. I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this painting where uh, Saturn devouring his son, like this one. This is, I don't know why. This is like one of my favorite paintings of all time. But this is uh, yeah. from a series called The Black Paintings uh, by Francisco Goya. Um, yeah. And uh, this is crazy because it was actually, he painted them on the wall of a, of a house that he was staying in. And they had to take it off the wall and to transplant it. Um, wow. It was, yeah, that's cool. I mean, it, it, this is dark stuff, but... Um, I don't know. Anyway. Uh, so anyways, so uh, what I've done is I'm actually using uh, Marvel. I'm a I'm a, a big comic book fan. I used to be I used to be really big into it. I'm a big fan of the Silver Surfer. Um, nice. So yeah, he's awesome. Um, I really like I really like uh, this version of uh, the Silver Surfer, um, which is again this is why people like art for different reasons. But so the uh, Originally, this is Steve Buscemi, um, but what he and he and Jack Kirby, who Jack Kirby is like the originator of like every single big Marvel character, he drew them all originally. Um, what they did, what they did similarly, but like separates them from everybody else is the the style of their eyes. So if you look like the the black lining around the eyes, um, mm. they. Uh, like all of their characters have that same. If you if you go look if you go look at anything Jack Kirby did, you'll like they have very distinct eyes, and that's why I always um, was a big fan of this version of the sorry of Silver Surfer. So uh, what it's I've just done, got more depth to him, right? Oh, uh, you like... don't. Yeah, it's and you could just I don't know. It's fun. It's cool because with comics, like especially the older stuff, you could just pick it up and you'd be like, I know exactly. Well, even with the new stuff too, you can just pick it up and be like, I know who this artist is, and. Um, current the, the state of the current comic book market is that like um a lot of times what they'll do is they'll release a comic and they'll have multiple variant covers right so mm, maybe you yeah. don't follow you're not reading that comic but you like an artist and um and they'll do like a different cover uh so you'll pick up that comic just for that cover um yeah um Sorry. Anyway, so that's so actually an interesting play from a personalization perspective. I mean, I think as we kind of look at that, right? Let's talk about 
data transformation as a whole for a second and like you've got the api here right so imagine if every time you called it it gave you a, a different story related from a, a comic perspective right it's almost like a the multiverse theory right if we get into like comic book and, and art history and I, when we kind of think about multiverses right um related to data uh, we technically have that when we look at the different warehouses that can technically exist, right? Um, and then even doing temporal snapshots like over time, um, being able to see into those, based on the rules, things can kind of change, right? And I think that's interesting for us to explore um, because as we kind of talk about the the future here from a data perspective, right? There's different things that we're going to learn um, as we develop IoT sensors, right? And then when we look at that historical data, are we going to go back and maybe re-standardize, right, um, some of those data sets in order to make them usable for longer periods of time, right? Because um, that's part of what's going to drive the AI model. Um, as an example, for things like COVID, right, um, that's kind of like a black swan event. And when we look at um, art, it's kind of the same thing, right? You have these new methodologies in terms of art come along. So if you were trying to value the art, right, or the images, how do you do that in such a way where it kind of factors in originality? Well, I think it's originality is the interesting. So uh, we have a mutual friend who's very much into NFTs uh, and I was talking to him the other day about um, about why certain NFTs are exploding right now, and and uh, he's saying why a lot of that is booming is because the, like the future belief of the value, and so um, anytime like a new kind of NFT, like the bo the board apes, which are like you know those are the that one and then the crypto or the crypto punks or whatever, um, mm -hmm. they. Uh, they were like the first of their kind. So like now there's a ton of different bored apes or boredish apes or um, sad apes and people are sad monkeys, bored monkeys. People are just make, like ripping off this original idea, right? But but yeah. the reason that bored apes has this value is because it's, well, there's other reasons, but because it's like the original version of that. So um, he was showing me some other ones that were like, like crypto ladies or something like that. And it's just like this really cool art of like, here up of like different women and had like different hair and stuff like that and and he had shown me like the value of that one had went up because one the art's good but two it was like the first really good um it was like the first really good uh like piece like that um yeah so sorry i apologize my kids are playing like right outside <laughs> and and i'm and it's uh, anyway um but, but what's cool, I, I mean, I mean, not to get back onto the NFT thing, but like that whole space is crazy because not only like does you, do you owning, it, it's taking the art to the next level, right? Because not only, so let's say I own a board ape, right? I don't only have this stored value, but I can get into like events like board, the board ape yacht club. Like they'll, they'll have their own events where like I can show up and as long as I can prove that I own it, I can get into these events with millionaires for free. Or yeah. uh, you can now tie that, you know, that board ape to your, um, to like your Twitter so that people know that you actually own that board ape. I, I, I think that's, I think that's a really cool and that's where we're crossing. Like, so art is just a commodity, right? It's the only, it's, it's people buy it to store wealth. Um, and we, I mean, and, and art teaches us things, right? And it, it makes us feel a certain way, but like on the high end, like what, well, why do people buy, why do people buy Goyas if they, if they can, like, it's not, they don't put, you know, a hundred million dollars on their wall. They are just to show it to their friends. It's, it's a, well, it is a little bit of a flex, but it's also a store value, right? That's how you hide your wealth and stuff like that. So, but what's interesting, so now with like NFTs that bridges that is it not only allows you to store your wealth, uh, use it as a, as a, as an asset class, it does, it gives you access to other things, which 
again, as we move into the metaverse, I think that's going to be, I think that's super cool. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I just, my brain's going all over the place right now. That would, that would be, uh, okay, we're going to talk about this API that I built uh, before yeah. we go much further down that. Um, so if you, if uh, I was just showing, so what's cool about this, um, I love talking about APIs on these, on the Transformation Tuesdays and the Thought Leader Thursdays and all that stuff because um, they're so available to us and a lot of people, you know, just don't know how to use them. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And with a tool like Alteryx or uh, let's say other free tools, uh, Postman, uh, like it's it's not incredibly difficult to do. But actually, what's crazy about this one is while I was building it, somebody else built like a 30 minute YouTube video about how to how to build it out so like it's this is all very accessible to people um yeah uh yeah so uh what i have uh i wanted to build right was something a, a tool where we can select a character and then it provides a list of all of the comics uh that that character cool. appeared in and i think what i want to do later is uh expand this uh just to note uh, are the three at three on Wednesdays uh, on the 8th of June is Marvel. So I think what we're going to do is we're going nice. to take the results of this and we're going to uh, build some cool stuff uh, over there. Uh, because not only like are the comics that they're in available, but let's, uh, it has events and series. So um, uh, I'm not quite sure what the difference is between these are from this perspective, but like normally like you have your series, it'll be like uh, Moon Knight volume three and it'll be like 20 comic books, but then <laughs> you'll have like an event, which is um, like a crossover. And it'll be like, like the new Avengers, right. And it'll have like Moon Knight and Wasp and like a handful of characters and they'll show up in each other's books, but it'll be yeah. like, this is, this book is Moon Knight number eight. But it's also, and I'll say it's a part, part of New Avengers series or something like that. So there's crossover. So I, I, I'm, I think that's what that might be, which would be cool to see like that crossover. I, again, I want to see, sorry, now, now that like I can get this, all this information, I want to do like a, yeah. an analysis of like who shows up the most with who. Like where, so, sorry. Yeah, because that's almost like a foreign key, right? The events are like a foreign key into another series. So if you're yeah. looking to see, hey, how does how does all this mesh together, right? Because each, mm -hmm. essentially each character is going to have their own star schema that exists, right? So they may have their own individual storyline, but as we know, like all these relationships kind of intertwine, right? Which mm -hmm. is what happens basically from a data transformation perspective. We're sitting here focused on um, maybe one particular set of data, right? And then not realizing what's the comprehensive or holistic picture um like the avengers right so if we pull all that together oh how does it all how does it all actually come together um and then how do we beat thanos right would be the, <laughs> the real question so i don't i don't think all the business objectives are that sinister but um, we could definitely pretend like it right well in the original Infinity Gauntlet story, Silver Surfer was a big part of that. Silver Surfer and Adam Moloch, who was my other favorite character, they were a big part of that original. We'll talk about that later. Um, but what's cool about, so again, it's cool. Yes, you're spot on. Um, so we want to be able to do that analysis. How, like, it'd be super cool to build some uh, dashboard that shows that overlap between these characters and their stories, but also to get into like the meta of it, right? So like you can do into the, go into the creators so you'd be like, who who was the first, or who wrote the story, or um, I think somewhere in here it's got who actually like was the original creator, or maybe it might not. Some of the stuff data we might have to back into, like we have to go find their first appearance, and then we have to figure out who the creator of that comic was uh, because they have like the artists in 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 older comics they had like pencilers and uh, inkers, and they had color, so like they had. They had three different people oh, doing the art. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was a lot of people. Um, and they actually, originally, the original pages were like this big. So they draw the pages big, and then it got shrunk down for the comic. Interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah, so anyway, all this is available to us. Um, it's a pretty robust uh, series of APIs for free. You just have to sign up for the Marvel um, at 
uh, marvel.com and then it opens up the developer portal for you um and like i said there is a bunch of free stuff on youtube if you just want to google it uh, you can figure out how all this works and this one's really nice too because it gives you um once you're signed in uh it lets you try it out so like it'll it'll help you build these uh parameters and then it'll build your um, your request url for you and then show you what the response looks like and again if we're using alteryx we know that this stuff's super easy to parse with the json tool um, as well as passing this into the download tool. Um, yeah, so what I, what I did was I created a, um, a workflow. It's actually uh, an analytic app. So the idea of it is we, if we put this like on a server, you come in here and you can look for whatever your favorite character is. Uh, nice. So mine is Silver Surfer, and he's not in here as Silver Surfer. He's in here as his real name, Norn Rad. Um, and I apologize, I haven't finished this workflow, and but I'm going to still work on it. So I'd go in and I'd find Norn Rad, and I'd finish. And what it's going to do is it's going to um, run through. Okay, so this API is interesting. Uh, if anyone's done API, I guess if if you have or haven't done API work, there's a process of the API called an offset. So um, mm -hmm. what they do is they try to limit you to the amount of data that you can do in a single poll. Um, they don't care how many times you hit it. Well, as long as you're not like trying to like take down the, the service, uh, like a, an attack, but you can hit it a bunch of times. Uh, let's say there's 3000 records that comes back, but there's a limit to hundred records. It's better on their system. If you hit it 30 times for hundred records a piece than mm -hmm. uh, one time for 3000 records. So uh, they have an offset process here. Uh, so what we've done, I'll just, uh, I'll just walk you through this real quick. Uh, clear cash. So uh, what we do always always build start building a basis. So this is uh, we'll talk about oh art design patterns uh, <laughs> right. So every time that uh, that we're building an API in Alteryx, I always start with the text input tool because um, we're going to grab things like the base URL and any like additional uh, piece of the URL that we're going to have to add. And again, all of this can be found he uh, here. So. There, sorry, there's an earlier page that had that base on it, but if you look here, like it has the extended URL here. So everything past the um, marvel.com is going to be right here. Only I expanded mine a little bit because I see that there is a pattern here of always v1 public. Anyway, um, and so yeah, uh, this one. Even, sorry, those design patterns are interesting, Tracen, because when we kind of talk about those, right? Um, as an artist for data transformation, right? Recognizing those patterns is essentially trying to recognize the type of art that you're doing, right? And then as you start to build those out, those are commonalities amongst all platforms, right? Because it's really API calls that you're trying to master. Mm -hmm. So it's really, hey, this is the medium, right? So um, whether it's stone or um, if it's canvas or something, now that you understand what that medium is right you can do whatever you want with it so you can make it dynamic you can do it um, in different platforms matillion uh, mm -hmm. streams right um, you could do that here in alteryx and can kind of ex trifacta. expand from there trifacta exactly yeah, yeah. and i think what's you um uh, like once you understand like the meta uh, you could probably even call it meta, like what it takes to develop, like the information about developing an API. I, mm -hmm. I'm building a wiki for uh, an internal data meaning wiki here about this. And so like, what are the lists of things? So there's, I guess there's two design processes, right? So you go through your, um, your list of things that your questions that you ask yourself, and this doesn't only like fit into APIs, right? Like every time you get a problem in, Tableau, Power BI, Alteryx, any, anything that we do, your machine learning, um, you, you always have your series of questions, right? And so we're working through that right now for API development um, here at, uh, or API, pulling API development, not actually developing an API. Um, but yeah, so we start here with this, um, this, uh, 
sorry, the URL builder. And then mm -hmm. uh, I don't really want to show you guys this because, oh, I guess I'm showing you guys. So this, uh, I'll refresh this later. But, so we have keys that we're supposed to have with this and a timestamp. Now, um, this one's really interesting because it requires us to send a hash. Um, and a lot of people don't know about this in Alteryx or just in general. So I actually did an Inspire talk about MD5 hashing like in, in Nashville. Mm -hmm. Uh, we did a, we did a, um, so the idea of that, right, is you can take a string and you can, um, oh goodness, what's the word when you, it's like a super common word. I just can't think of it right now. Um, you encrypt it using MD5 encryption, which isn't like a super high level of encryption, but it works yeah. for use cases like this. Um, uh, or well, what we had done with it in a previous life is that I used it to compare records. So mm -hmm. like as a new record, um, like like we, we would have uh, records coming from multiple data sources and there wasn't a key. So what I would do is uh, I had to see if the same person was already coming in from a different data source. And so we used first name, mm -hmm. last name, I think it was like address. We had done a bunch of stuff before that, but we had essentially five fields that we were like, we hashed those, and if the hash value is the same as the one we've already processed, then we make sure we don't have to run it because we had to do um, geospatial work. And anyway, uh, yeah, those are very expensive processes, right? Yeah, and exactly. I think that's that's part of the art form here as well because when we look at this, right, um, the the catch with kind of doing hashes, I'm thinking there's an HMAC macro as well right for encryption um, there's some of those processes that have already been built and at that point trace and i always think hey just steal like an artist right like <laughs> take the take the techniques and don't reinvent the wheel because when you have things like this where it's already done right it provides yeah. that that unique key where now you can identify things and you're not having to recombine it every time yep exactly um and I've actually, I think I was, I was, I, I, somebody last week I told them about this solution. So this, this keeps coming up. So maybe uh, we're going to have to talk about this at a later event, specifically just about these things. Uh, but anyway, so what it does is it just, it hashes these. So a timestamp, and this doesn't have to be, a, well, you know, anyway, so it hashes these together and we create our URL. So the final URL looks like this. So, you know, we've got our base URL. And again, this is the this is my favorite part about Alteryx is that, or Alteryx for APIs is that you can build these URLs here, you know, using these. This is something that like people probably don't even think about, right, when they first get into Alteryx. So, you know, you, you think about Alteryx as like a analytics platform or like a data manipulation platform, but we use Alteryx here to actually construct um, these URIs, right? Um, so that we can like this one because of this drop down tool what i have i've made it dynamic so that anybody can select one of these people and it passes in their id for marvel which i had to go get that earlier but um it's 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 uh it's not i guess everyone i wouldn't say anyone's primary thinking about how alteryx works but it is how you can use alteryx so um that's what we're doing here so we, we have two API calls from here. So what we're doing is we're going, so this one's interesting too, right? Because I talk about how they have the offset in the um, in the limits on the amount of calls you can make. What I do is I make sure that we pass uh, this, this initial API call um, right here, returns the amount of comics that they actually show up in. So right uh, here is the available. And so what we've done is instead of building some process that guesses like it like calls until it no longer gets a return, uh, we actually take this available number and then we break it down into chunks of 100 uh, so that we can pass it through. I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Uh, and then it won't fail when there's less than 100. So uh, a good example, I was looking at Gamora earlier. Um, which we're all familiar with Gamora, if you've seen Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, actually, a really funny story about her first appearance. I'm actually going to tell it. So when I, when I was uh, big into collecting, I bought her first appearance, um, which is Marvel Spotlight number 182, I think, uh, if I recall, 181. 
Me too. It's one of those. Um, and she, um, I bought it and I got it shipped to my house and they have grading. Uh, they do comic grading, which is uh, what it does. They put in a plastic uh, insert that you can't break. And then it, they tell you how good the quality of the comic. And it's, it's a way that people can um, sell a comic and then there's no arguing about like, it's, it's similar to <laughs> coins or cards. Like you can't yeah. like, so you look, oh yeah, this is an 8.0. And then there's nothing, if it's a good grading system like CGC or CBCS, like there's no arguing against it. And so people yeah. can put a dollar amount on it and it's not, anyway. So, but what's really great about that is that once it's in that sleeve, it's got a number to it. So like that is that book, um, which I think is like, we go back to NFTs, right? NFT solves this problem. But so what had happened is uh, I got it shipped to me and it got stolen off my porch. Um, and I, I knew all of the comic shops in like 10 miles of my house. So I went to, I called them all and I was like, Hey, it's Trey. I, I shop there all the time and they all knew me. And, um, and I was like, I just got this stolen off. Uh, it's, it's a graded and I told them exactly what it was. Cause it, again, everybody knew. So I told them exactly yeah, here's what it was. My blockchain, my yeah, blockchain yeah, exactly. number on it. Right. <laughs> yeah. I said, if anybody comes in with a 182, uh, Marvel Spotlight 182, um, and it's graded an 8.0, and I gave him the number. I'm like, that's mine. I got it stolen. And I sent him all the eBay information, and I put in a police report and all that stuff. Like three days later, it shows up at a comic store, uh, and I got my comic book back, which is it's like impossible to get your stuff back when it gets robbed off your off your porch, right? So, um, yeah, so that's fun. Anyways, but that's the first appearance of Gamora. Um, anyway, so I picked like a Gamora here, and she shows up in 70 different comics. Wow. Um, uh, so many different issues that is. Um, and, uh, so when I run this, right. Cause the limit, I, th I believe the base, the, this it's, it's, uh, the max limit is a hundred. If you look through the documentation, you can see this, but, uh, what I've done is, so, uh, if it's something like 70, which is under the max, um, it, it only, it only pushes once, but let's say it's Iron Man. He shows up in like 5,000 comics and, and it, uh, it creates an iteration. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so this is, I love macros so much. Um, this is a batch macro with, I could either build an iteration, iterative macro, but this is a, if you guys haven't seen this tool, this is a generate rows tool. This yeah. works like an iterative macro. So if you're having a hard time wrapping your head around iter iterative macros, um, if you're, uh, this is a really good so the idea here is that like it starts with an expression and then it find it has a condition and then it'll run through that uh loop until it meets um uh, i'm sorry this is the this is what happens every loop and it will run through it until it meets this condition now yeah. a batch macro okay so without getting if there's um if you're familiar with like a, a coding language like python or even sql now has them um there's four and while loops, right? Where four loops will run it through once for every parameter that you feed it. And a while loop will run through um, until a condition is met. And so this is a batch macro, which is a for loop. Um, this one is only built to, to run once, but how Alteryx passes metadata into things um, using, I had to use this, which is fine because I know how to do it, but uh, I had to use this process. So. Um, I love macros. I could talk about macros and Alteryx all day. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> no, I think those are an important part of like the Alteryx artwork, right? Because yeah. those are things that we actually trade, right? So everybody kind of knows the crew macros, right? Oh, yeah. And when we talk about a, from a broader art perspective, right? The, the loops I think are critical. Um, mm -hmm. because all of us understand what loops are and you'll have some people go crazy and they'll uh, get into a platform like Alteryx and they're like, why aren't there loops? Like, I don't yeah. understand, right? And it's just kind of a, a different take or like you had said, a different title um, or a different cover, right? For the magazine mm -hmm. or not the magazine, the, the comic, variant. right? Yeah, the variant of the, the comic here. And when we look at that, um, that's really, I think the key in terms of us understanding each other going forward, um, even within an organization, right? So Tracen, you may be working with someone who's using another transformation platform and the fact that you know that other language is critical, right? Hey, this is 
uh, a for loop and then here's how we're using it right mm -hmm. um, i think all of us becoming familiar with those uh, different dialects become important um, because then it really helps us carry on conversations like this yeah and i think i think sorry i was gonna say the frustrating part about it you talk about what alterix does out of the box and this is something that it does out of the box but unfortunately like i so when I pitch macros, I'm like, macros are this piece that you can do you to like you take a, a a design pattern and instead of rebuilding it in your workflow every time, you can take this macro and put it in there and it does it for you. Um, but when it comes to like batch and iterative macros, they're usually um, a way to subvert that lack of like out like there's no tool except for this one, except for the generate rows tool. There's no like loop or iterative functionality that I can just drop. So you do have to be careful when you build these because you have to make sure you're sharing them or if you're publishing them, you have to either take them up with the workflow or you have to. And now we're getting into the meta of Alteryx. Um, but uh, but yeah, so if you have a server, you have to have them on a shared site. Um, super valuable, super cool. Uh, like you said, the crew macros. Crew macros are really cool because they solve a lot of problems for for folks like specifically running the runner tool uh the, the parallel block until finish um i think those are the only two i can really remember because yeah well, you've got um it's wait until is another one of my favorite ones um and then you've got all the the test tools um oh. so yeah that that is like uh or it's is it technically i think it's wait now i'm gonna have to look at the exact name because i use it quite a bit actually um is it, is it parallel block block until finish so that it actually waits no, for your stream to finish wait a second so oh, okay. then you can especially when you're doing api calls right if there's we know that there's a limit on there you can space out those calls um in order to uh break up some of the chunking so you don't blow a bunch of errors with your um with your workflow so obviously if you're on the server that'll kind of eat up some of the lanes but this helps it function a little bit more like uh kafka or apache nifi where you mm. can do um some of that streaming processing right yeah interesting yeah i don't i don't i don't use them i don't use those tools as much as i should uh yeah that's for sure. And there's unfortunately it, that again. So we talk about problems with things like this is that some organizations don't allow for like those third party tools in their environment. So it can be difficult to, uh, to get yeah. the full power. I, I've always thought that ultra should bring them in house, but, uh, that hasn't happened yet. So, which yeah, is funny because they were built by like their main engineer. Um, Adam. Yeah. Yeah. Adam, Adam Riley. Riley. Uh, and Mark for has built a few as well. Um, actually, that so your shirt is the Alteryx build one, right? Um, no, this one is actually this is a Georgia O'Keefe shirt. Oh, um, you had the Alteryx build one shirt on earlier. Oh yes, yeah, yes. I actually did have it on earlier today. Yes, yeah. So that... they they were building crew macros in Alteryx build two. I don't know what they did in Alteryx build. Yeah, that those were definitely fun. Actually, I have that's build two is actually the sticker that I have on my uh, laptop. Oh, nice! I my other laptops around here somewhere. I also have that one. Um, nice. Yeah, good times. Uh, anyway, sorry. So that was the so what we've done here is we made it create a bunch of. So if you look here, it creates all of these different calls. Awesome. Uh, and so there's a parameter here. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh, good thing I limit 100. I need to I need to make an adjustment to this. But essentially, what's uh, what's going on? Yeah. So, like, I think Sorry. this is a perfect oh. opportunity, right? What are what are some things that you would kind of change to my to help make this a little easier. Oh, um, easier to develop. Yeah, easier to develop. Or um, what are some things from a transformation perspective that would 
would make it easier if others were trying to follow this workflow? Um, well, I apologize. I haven't cleaned it up yet, but um, I, APIs are so tough because really you need the hands-on experience to like understand them. I, I've, I've been doing, I remember when I was like first getting to Alteryx, like back in 2016, I had like five API problems and <laughs> each one of them were so different. And I was like this, I don't know how anybody, it's, it's like regular expressions, right? You just have to do regular expression work or you just have to do API work for people to, to get it. But um, I, I would say one, one of the things that I'm working out again is like that whole design pattern thing for API, right? There's, there are, understanding, providing people an understanding of what an API calls or, or better yet, the parts of an API. Um, so like this one is interesting because it actually passes everything through in the URI. Uh, they, they don't always work that way. A lot of times uh, they pass information through the header or in the payload. Uh, I'm doing some API work right now that's actually pulling back some documents uh, so we have to use, uh, this different, oh, and then there's different, sorry. Uh, the best way to make, <laughs> to make APIs understandable for more people is to, uh, create training or normal, normalizing all the API. Yeah. I mean, it uh, is about normalization, right? It's, it's just yeah. like when an artist creates an, a unique piece of art, right? So the first mm -hmm. NFT then there's like, well, how do we classify it, right? Yeah. Is it technically just digital artistry? Is there something that's different about it, right? And I think that's where we come up with that, the new verbiage. So like pointillism, right? Or uh, some other method for creating art. Um, literally, I've got, I'll go ahead and pull it off the wall here because it'll be easy for me to get back on here. I literally have this old man in the sea one, right? Which looks really cool. This is literally the entire first chapter. Oh, cool. It's, it's the words kind of broken out that do the image. Oh, nice. So when we look at this from an, an artistry perspective, they're using uh, a different medium here to, to kind of accomplish that, right? And I think it's the same here from an API perspective you still want it to be categorized as an API so people can appreciate it, right? Um, and maybe access it. And then when we kind of talk about that, the design patterns are that accessibility, that the, the key, right? That's the mm -hmm. equivalent to the NFT today um, from a data perspective is, hey, can we come up with a design pattern that allows us to access this data source or experience the Marvel universe? Maybe interesting. Maybe that's what the maybe that's what this guy's YouTube video is, right? Like he he has the instructions of how to how to build it out. Or maybe <laughs> maybe it's it's the application we're creating, right? Like maybe yeah. not every developer has to understand how to do this, right? Like yeah. that your your back end, like they just want to see the results. They don't care about building it, right? You just need one person who understands APIs or APIs well enough. Um, yeah, and I think this is it's a difference, right? So we could talk about like containers and all those things. And I look at that being like the mass manufacturing of uh, art workflows, right? Like anybody can understand that in the organization. But then as you start to like work up the curve, like one thing that I thought was cool when you had first uh, kicked off this workflow is I'd I had never noticed that you could actually cache uh, the interactive tools. Oh yeah, I think it, I don't know. Well, it's interesting because the interactive tools only run when you're running it as an app. So I, I don't know if it actually, I actually did find out something last week that you can cache. You can cache a workflow at two different points. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that's super cool. So just in case anybody's curious what I mean by that, I could have a select tool coming out of here uh, and then a uh, record tool. And then like I'm doing work here and here, I can click on this and this, and I can cache. Um, At both points. Well, apparently you can't today, but the other day I could. Um, but yes, you're, maybe that's why I didn't know because sometimes it doesn't work. Cause there, and there are also certain tools you can't cache out of. Like I can't cache here cause it's got multiple outputs. Yeah. Um, you could do the two inputs. That one always works. 
Oh uh, yes. Yeah. So if these weren't text inputs, yes, that would make a make total sense. But yeah. oh goodness. Okay. <laughs> now I'm gonna work for so but so like this is again later how I, I'm I'm gonna want this to look. Um we'll we'll, we'll pivot this out. Sorry, I again I didn't get this finished all the way out. I apologize. But there's um you know everything comes in JSON data and then we just use our nifty JSON partial. This is like the, this is my favorite tool palette. I don't know if 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 uh, dynamic replace. Uh, dynamic. That's still my favorite favorite tool. Dynam really, mine's dynamic inputs always been my favorite tool. But uh, okay. I mean, to each his own, right? <laughs> <laughs> I probably use download tool uh, the most out of these. Download and JSON. That here, so even this is like a design pattern, right? Download exactly. tool, ninety nine percent of the time goes to a JSON parse tool. Um, or, uh, here. um, I guess this one, um, so this is a, this is an example where we're, we're sending out, um, we're actually downloading image files. And so this whole taking, converting something to a blob and then, um, outputting the blob as a file like this is an image there this is a design pattern right because you're always going to use these two um after each other yeah. Uh, <sighs> yeah and i think when we look at these you've got emails saying hey top five or for his marvel superheroes right as wolverine spider-man thor iron man and hulk and that's <laughs> literally may maybe where you want to use a batch macro right now it's still a design pattern rather than creating five workflows you would just do one that you can mm -hmm. process all those, right? Yeah, and I think that's, uh, let's see. Well, you could do two, two, um, how would I do that? Yeah, so this one isn't set up to accept something like that, but I could, um, yeah. where I, I wouldn't even have to, I don't even think I'd have to create a batch macro, but you could create a batch, batch, macro, yeah, batch macro to do it. Um, yeah. Again, where talking back to the, to the for loops, right? That they become a parameter and then you run, um the first work uh the first set of of calls for the hulk the second set of calls for thor the third set for iron man wolverine etc um yeah what's cool about that again again why i love Alteryx is that it, let's say this is some sort of data input from like a sql server or something like that and you've got a list of order numbers right you can take the that output and you could pass it into like a batch macro so like let's say you have 20 order numbers come back and you have to do a separate process for each order number like let's say you're building um uh invoices bringing all of this together right like you could use alteryx to build an invoice like you use the trace and are you really comparing invoices to art right now <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying you can create PDFs in Alteryx. Okay. And, uh... Sometimes I have I have tiers when they're beautifully constructed and I'm actually able to parse everything out of there, right? Yes, it's like watching like, the sunset. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I don't know. I think I always get my, uh, again, art teaches you something, performance art, whatever it is. I have moments in Alteryx still where like, especially around APIs and I'm just like banging my head against the wall and then something works. And then I just get up and I do like this bump. Right. I feel like that with the reporting tools, anytime I do anything with reporting tools, I'm like, I just, I just did some awesome stuff because they're not super easy to use. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I've got a couple that I want to share my screen here for. So let's, let's see here. Uh, let's do it. Oh. Let me see if I can just get, the screen to behave after I rejected some cookies here. I was trying to be. While you're bringing that up, I'll talk about my art real quick. This is um, the fear is the mind killer quote from Dune. Um, nice. Yeah. I, I haven't, I haven't seen the new movie because I wanted to see it in theaters. So I just never got around to it. And then my parents have like a home theater. I just have to wait to go do that. And then this one's called, this is just some like 90s metal wall art called Sizzle. I love it. Nice. 
my my wife was like, "Why did you bring that home?" And I'm like, "I'm gonna you'll never see it. I promise." And I put it on my wall. <laughs> now it's hanging out in the office, right? Yeah. Occasionally, I threaten to put it on the outside of our house, just like on our garage or something like that. Yeah, I think when we look at that, right, it it really is relative, like this, right? So maybe if if it was one of those paintings, I. I don't know if she would have let you pay pay seven to ten thousand dollars for that, right? <laughs> but all of a sudden, if she found out it was worth like four hundred thirty-two thousand, right? She might be like, "Yeah, I mean, maybe we could display it somewhere a little more prominent, right?" Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to share this article real quick. So um, Sydney actually posted. I'll I'll throw it here in the chat as well, um, just so everybody can can see it. But yeah. it's interesting because it literally talks about um, this portrait, right? And then it talks about using uh, design patterns like you were discussing for um, essentially doing AI generated images, right? So a lot of NFTs are actually doing this because then it really helps them scale um, the NFTs. So literally you can see here, um, this was the original, right? And then here's a bunch that are um, generated by the AI. So when you look at that, like some of them may pop out at you and you may say, oh yeah, I like that one or I don't like that one. And I think that's interesting because when you're starting to look at the, the different articles, yeah, exactly. Like what is art, right? And you start popping in and literally we can see hey, if you just had a bunch of these images, right, which is literally what Google is now, I have thousands of images of tulips, right? So if I were to try and imagine what a tulip looked like, right, if you uh, are one of the first generations off with Elon Musk to Mars, right, um, you may not have ever seen a tulip before. So what if we were to just synthesize what that looks like and you were doing that in the metaverse, right? And then like these or something similar, right? Where you can see AI just kind of developing and they've got lots of interesting ways in which um, there's kind of a gold rush that you're seeing um, in regards to the AI generated work. So as we kind of talk about this, I think, Tracy, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, we should do that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> This retirement plan, right? Why are we just yeah. vesting in, yeah. in crypto? Like you only have <sighs> currency, you should be investing in art as well, right? Or yeah. creating it. And so two things. One, I'll note uh, my session for Inspire is actually on what's called data sculpting, right? So um, what we've been talking about today is basically flat and digital. Um, what I was curious about and what my session is about is a 3D manifestation of the art, right? So when we look at this, um, I am have always been interested in 3D printing, right? And then also CNC machines, which one is essentially a reduction method where it's cutting it out of a material and then the other one builds it up, right? Yeah. So as we kind of talk about those two, what I was trying to understand is, hey, if I were to sculpt something, right, what information could I put in there um, in this case, I was looking at LiDAR data, right? And then I'll be going through how you can use LiDAR data to literally sculpt something out. And that information is publicly available. So if you wanted a sculpture of where I used to live, which is Colorado, right? I used to live in Colorado Springs. There's Garden of the Gods. It's extremely beautiful. It has tons of um, natural rock formations like the kissing camels. Um, go and check that out. Like literally it looks like two camels kissing. Um, and that's not something that humans made. It was just there, right? Um, so when we look at this, right, you've got that extreme um, for literally data-driven art, right? Um, and then you have this, which is actually uh, Simpson images. So I'm actually not a huge fan of Simpsons, but I know that that is like one of the longest running uh, from an art perspective, uh, shows that there is, right? So when we look at this, um, what was incredible is literally when I pulled this data set in, um, I've got this section grayed out because it was pretty big. There were literally um, 10,000 different images that I was able to find like that. And then what we were using is actually some image processing 
let me unveil this real quick here so we can see it. So these are, I love this with the new containers, how you can gray it out um, yeah. and still see what's, what's kind of going on underneath it. Um, so from here you have uh, pulling in some images. Um, I did a select just for the sake of running it today because it is fairly large, but literally you pull in those images, right? And then you do some standardization. So we're trying to fix the specific aspect ratio so it doesn't get too out of hand with different size images, right? And then from there, essentially what we're looking at is, hey, if I were to do a sample on this, right? Could I start working on image classification? So like all of us will have done like the iris, um, when you start getting into data science, uh, the iris, uh, use case, right? Um, which I actually do love flowers. Um, and as we kind of go beyond that, our goal is really to say, okay, can we take those images and then do the classification, right? And then what is kind of the um, batches that we're looking for? How many uh, clusters are there? And then just kind of working from there. Um, so when we look at this, um, what I was excited to see is, hey, we could essentially take that information and then bring it in and then offer some predictive analysis in terms of understanding who those characters are, right? And then from there, accomplishing some classification modeling, which in this case, from a display perspective, it's gonna show um, a character's name, right? Because we know where it came from. And then what percent likelihood is this that it's going to be that specific character, right? And then what's interesting is we kind of see this, right? Is that can help us start to understand more around um, what is going to happen um, in the future in regards to artistry. Um, are there different ways of kind of accomplishing this? Who's responsible for it, right? And then again, like even price points. So when we're investing in, in some of these things, right, it could get as crazy as, I'll share another one of my passions, um, are actually bats. And believe it or not, these are actually paintings that uh, bats did. So mm. what they do is they literally take some some paint paintbrushes, and you can see it here. They take some paintbrushes and they throw some fruit on the end of it, and then the bats are going to town eating the fruit and they're literally drawing these pictures. So it's really cool to kind of see like, okay, is this just something that's weird, right? Or if you were to take these images, right, and try and correlate what the value is and you process that against other art, um, would you come up with maybe an absurd uh, dollar figure to be selling this for because it relates to some, uh, some other famous artists? Interesting. So it's so it doesn't only does it take into effect like that it was made by a bat or like like is that part of the meta? Yeah, I mean that's a great question. Maybe people like bat art, right? There's yeah. all kinds of of different mediums, like just like kids doing art, right? Yeah. Um, you see that as well, and some of the paintings, like this one, I've seen plenty of paintings that look similar to this that are very abstract, right? Yeah. And sometimes I love paintings like this. And honestly, unless someone told me, you would have no idea that a bat painted this. Right? Yeah. And these are 60 bucks, right? So it's not not too bad for art considering the materials, yeah. but those actually go to benefit the bats. So when we talk about um, from either like ecotourism or any of that kind of stuff, right? It's interesting because it's it's art with a cause behind it. Uh, and when I look at, okay, classification, et cetera, you can kind of see that broken down here. Um, literally, if we look at the config here, you'll see that we're trying to predict it, um, what that class looks like, right? And then when we go from a display perspective, right, and we try and drill in, we can see the uh, interactive portions right here, um, where literally we can say, okay, if I'm looking at this table, I can see a breakout of the predictability here. 
and start to understand what some of those averages are, where some of those images might be predicted, right? So, yeah, and you know, <laughs> Neil's calling out uh, Batcaso, right? And when we look at this, um, there could even be self-sufficient bats, right? Um, I think as we kind of look at this, I mean, there's all kinds of ways of doing that, right? I was just watching the news and they were talking about um, the guy who uh, attempted to kill, I'm gonna blank on the president's name here. Um, Reagan. Reagan, yes, thank you. So the gentleman who attempted to kill Reagan, literally he, um, switch gears after he got out of um, jail, right? And now he's doing a YouTube channel and playing music, right? And when I look at these things from a self-sufficiency perspective, I think we always think that there's only going to be one lever that we can kind of pull, right? Um, and America's all about the side hustles, right? So literally you could go here and maybe you create an AI model that is generating art, right? Um, and then from there, that allows you to provide some of these side hustle things. And when we look at that, I think the the catch there is really like, who are you sharing this data with, right? Are there any minor adjustments? Literally, you could adjust those inputs, whether it's uh, different artists, et cetera, and then come up with your own board apes, right? Or um, other practices. So I think it, it really helps us expand um, what it is that will be we'll be doing here in the future with art from an industry perspective. So. John, John Wayne Gacy made, made art too, didn't he? Yes. Talk about criminals that, that, uh, that ended up making art. Well, and I think that's crazy because like all of us are fascinated. Well, I, I shouldn't say all of us, <laughs> but a lot of us are fascinated with like, uh, criminal minds, right. Or we like to watch those sci-fi, um, or uh, crime related movies, true right? Crime. Like, yeah. yeah, true crime. So NCIS, all those things. And I think understanding some of those pieces become become important in terms of us preserving history, right? It can mm -hmm. be a one-sided view and, and part of that is art. So, yep. awesome. Well, we're definitely over on time here. So thank you all for joining us. Thanks um, everybody. And as always, uh, feel free to sign up for transform Tuesdays. We'll throw that here in the chat. Uh, and next week's session is actually going to be about the earth. So speaking of a, a big blank canvas, right? <laughs> um, we'll see some, some cool stuff here. So thank you everyone and happy Tuesday. And we hope to see you next week. Have a great day, everybody.